Okay, it says record, so I think we're good. So, just for the benefit of the tape, we're here at my father, Larry Frank's um, celebration of his life. And um, so here's some stuff about him. He was born December the 1st, 1923 on a farm four miles southeast of Simric, Saskatchewan. And his parents were Jacob and Johanna Frank. And this family were true Canadian homesteaders. My father's parents came from Austria and Germany. They married in Canada and they faced the raw Canadian prairie. They broke sod and they lived in a sod, shoddy? Is that the right word? Soddy, soddy? Okay, a, a sod, whatever. A sod hut, that's, that's the thing. And they created a farm out of the raw land. They came for the great Canadian dream and they achieved it. And we still have family on that land, don't we? Do we have family on that land or is it? Close by? I don't know. Maybe? Well, in those yeah. days, the government would give you a grant of one quarter if you moved on the land and moved 10 acres each year. Well, there we That's go. That's how the, the, the people all got around do that. Now, this is Freddie Yoke. He grew up with my dad. Nice. And they've been friends all through. Um, and they attended a one-room school. This is real Canadian stuff. And that's only, like, my grandparents coming to Canada. Um, at age six, my dad, when he was 16, his father died very suddenly. And the family sold the farm and they moved to Regina. And then dad started his very varied career. He worked as a driver for a salesman. And he slept in the car to save money. <laughs> it sounds like him. Um, anybody remember who that, where he worked? Who that? Yeah. I think the salary came next. Well, then it was that furniture. The furniture place? Okay. Oh, somebody remembers. Um, and then he worked for the Great Rest Salary. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. And then he worked for the CN Railway for a short time, he said. And when he was on assignment to Esteban, he met my mom. And the story goes that the guy said, oh, there's a really pretty girl over in the grocery store. <laughs> so he went over to see, and he couldn't get her to turn around, so he threw something at her. And <laughs> And if you know my mother, I'm sure it was something like this. <laughs> Pee on, right? Anyway, it worked. And they got married not that much longer than that in, in 1944. And uh, Dad signed up for the Navy, and they had a week to get married. So it was... And there's a picture of them there. Um, and Dad served until the end of the war. He didn't go overseas, but he did his bit. And their first child, Douglas, was born while they lived in Regina. After the war, Dad was always looking for the next opportunity. So his brother found this place on, in Providence Bay, Ontario, which is on Manitoulin Island. That was Ernie, yeah, the oldest brother. He was the one that was always finding the business deals everywhere. Um, and uh, Manitoulin Island is the largest freshwater lake in the world. And they had a, 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 a summary hotel there called the Commercial Hotel. And Uncle Ernie had the, mm, the Bayview Lodge. It was a fishing lodge. Um, yeah, and they did it all. There was 10 rooms and one bathroom for the guests. And then they had a, a living area. And they cooked, they cleaned, they did the serving, they did the administration. Oh, Uncle Walter was a partner with them in that venture. Um, and Mom and Dad even did the entertainment with the fiddle and piano for dances. <laughs> so they were very popular. And Darwin was born during this time. And Walter, they also did learn a lot of things. Well, I, <laughs> I have two stories about that time. <laughs> Uncle Walter uh, was on occasion assigned to babysit Dougie while Mom and Dad played the dance. But he had this tendency to sneak out. Dougie would be sleeping and he'd sneak out and come to the dances until my mother caught him and gave him stink eye. And then he'd skedaddle back. He's, he's a pretty good guy all around, but he slipped up a bit there. Um, and in 1946, Manitoulin Island was temperate. So people had to leave the island and drive to Sudbury to buy alcohol. And there just may have been a tiny bit of bootlegging at the commercial hotel. <laughs> and uh, one day, the chief of police came in and said, Larry, give me a case of beer. And Dad had this dilemma. Do I uh, say, what are you talking about, and offend the chief of police? Because small town, you know, you got to be careful. Or does he sell it to him and then risk the consequences of that? So he takes the risk and he sells it to him and the chief of police. Thanks, Larry. And 
Best buddy. Best buddy, yeah. <laughs> there were no problems with the local police after that. So after three years of doing that, they were ready for another adventure. So off they went. They went to Little Current, and they purchased a jewelry store. Now at that time, Dad had, you know, he was a farm kid that had a few jobs, and you know, there was this guy, um, Elf Jackson, he wanted to sell his jewelry store, but you know, I guess he was having trouble selling it. So he did this deal with Dad. He taught Dad the jewelry business and watchmaking, and the amount of money he had in inventory in his business and what he owed to creditors was about the same. So Dad just took it over, kind of with a handshake, with, and some training. And Dad told a lot of stories about Alf Jackson. And Alf Jackson used to live in the back of the jewelry store. Did he? Yeah, bring all his cronies in there, and they like to pull the cork, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so Dad, it finally got so bad with the smoking and the hiking and the drinking that Dad just finally said, you, you got to go, Alf. I can't run this business with you in here all the time. So we got him another place to go to. That's how, that's how it happened. <laughs> Thank you. That's my brother Darwin. <laughs> I heard the whole story. <laughs> so they did that for four years, and then they were ready for another adventure. So they moved to Harriston, and they bought a larger jewelry store, and Debbie was born there. And this was a time that was rich with friendship for the family. And I know Darwin says it was the best years, and Dad, he, he always felt badly for leaving his friends in Harriston. He was... Um, very where's, attached there. Where's Harrison? What province? Ontario. Ontario. <laughs> if you, if you, the, the, the southern part of Ontario, you know, that little bit that goes down around the Great Lakes, it's kind of right in the middle. Not too far from Stratford or Kitchener, Waterloo. Niagara. <laughs> um, and after five years, they outgrew that store, so they moved to Listowel. And this time they opened a brand new store. They got, found a newly renovated building and they brought... They bought new manufactured fixtures, which was a big deal to lay out the money for that. And, um, of course, it was all a celebration because I was born. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it has been. And he was there for about nine years. I don't know how many. Around 1970, he decided he was going to retire. So think about that. Farm boy, you know, really starting out on his own with nothing. And by the time he's 46, he's able to retire, and he's still got a bunch of kids at home. Yes, I think that's really impressive. However, it only lasted for four months, and he was bored. <laughs> and he built a shop over our carport, and he fixed jewelry and watches in that for a couple of years. And sometime around then, my two oldest brothers moved to Victoria, and that drove my mother crazy. She bugged him every day, and so pretty soon the whole family packed up, we put all our belongings in a CN container, and out we came to Victoria. Because the grandkids. Oh, yes. The gr- it was yes, it was Brian's fault. <laughs> <laughs> and Matthew. Yes. We adored those boys. So, uh, and there's my parents, right? They, they tried to retire, you know. They finally, you know, things are pretty good. They pick up, they move to Victoria, they take their entire life savings, and they open another brand new jewelry store in a city. I just, it's so ballsy. <laughs> and uh, dad I remember dad built most of the cabinets like the showcases where the jewelry went in and the wall cabinets and the window pieces he built that all by hand and we were all there helping stain and, and anyway where was that store? that store was at 728th street wow and uh, it grew I mean he didn't just stay there I mean he expanded twice and then he moved to Douglas street and you know it went on for a while but he finally did retire in 1989 after more than 40 years in the jewelry business. Well, they both retired. And mom and dad were married 52 years when mom passed away in 1996. But dad didn't stop. He started a new life. He met Inus. And we just love you to bits and we're so grateful that you and dad had this wonderful, fascinating and interesting relationship. <laughs> and I felt normal. (laughs) And Dad and Inus formed a bond that lasted the rest of his life, which was almost 20 years. Um, He moved to his condo on Jubilee Avenue, where he lived to the age 90. He was driving his car, going dancing, playing cards, and enjoying life. One time, we went 
that dance we went to at um, Monterey, I dragged a bunch of friends there, and they were doing, you know, sort of rock and roll kind of thing. And there's my dad in a white suit. <laughs> First on the dance floor. Sure. My friends all went home before he did. I said to Nathan, we are not leaving before my 80-some-year-old dad leaves. <laughs> so we hung it out until he finally went home, and then we left. I'm so tired. <laughs> no, seriously. Oh my and he's dancing with all the girls. These guys are so going. <laughs> laughing. Dad was full of life. He loved baseball, hockey, golf, playing his fiddle, playing cards. He joined the Cook Street Activity Center, and he said it was a wonderful place to play bridge and cribbage and enjoy time with his friends. He was a member of Grace Lutheran Church, the Royal Canadian Legion from Harrison, Ontario, and the Fairfield New Horizons on Cook Street. Dad had a very strong faith. It was a simple faith, but it, it was strong. He knew where he was going, and at the end, he was ready to go. And he died like he lived, head on, and looking forward to the next adventure. And then I had just a couple of things uh, that I learned from Dad. Because, you know, he, he, he was, you know. <laughs> or the fork. You take a and you turn it upside down and you tap the tines on the table. Yeah. And you know it's coming. <laughs> and you just have to... <laughs> That's how you know I'm, I'm miffed when I do that. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. So things I learned from my dad. <laughs> to be accepting and kind to people no matter how different they are. We had so many different people come through our lives and it, it didn't matter how freaky or weird they were. They were loved and welcomed and treated with dignity. <laughs> and then there was the financial advice, which was always very sound. Yeah. Always spend a little bit less than you earn. Can't go wrong with that. And I remember when we were doing a mortgage one time, and I was talking to him about you know how fast we could pay it off. When you negotiate your mortgage, don't think only about paying it off fast. Keep enough money available to still enjoy life. My thought, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know the stock market. He said, "There's nothing wrong with gambling a bit or playing the stock market, as long as you can afford to lose whatever you risk." Yeah. <laughs> um, and just watching him, um, don't let lack of education stop you from being successful. Uh, and and kind of through that, that I can achieve amazing things if I believe and put in the effort. And lately, don't be afraid of death. Think of it as your next big adventure. And uh, that's it for me. And if anybody else would like to come and say something, please. So I don't. I don't know. So if, if you guys saw the cards up here, yeah. She. My wife, my beloved, mentioned the card game, right? And kind of passed over that. Larry was vicious. <laughs> and he taught me how to play this game, cribbage. And he had a best friend, his name was uh, Johnny Fife. Fife. And I distinctly, like it was yesterday, on that kitchen table in the house on the ambassador, the two of them, I think they had money riding on the, the cribbage game. They, they, they have a little score. They keep yeah. it the whole year, and it was like a, a nickel a point. Or That's something. right. And I think I think it, I asked Johnny after the game, after this, anyway, I'll get to that. But I think there was 15 bucks. It was the big one. <laughs> it was the big one. Anyway, Larry got this hand, a perfect hand. And he put it down, you know, like, like that. And Johnny Fife took his cards and Son of a bitch! <laughs> and your dad just chuckled and chuckled. <laughs> Sorry for swearing at that.
I get wound up, you'll be here the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> but I promise you, I'm going to stick to Bobby Burns because he did it for me. An honest man here lies at rest, as ere God with his image blessed. The friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age, the guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtues warmed, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there is another world, he lives in bliss, and if there's not, he made the best of this. <laughs> I have to tell you a couple of stories that go back a long, long way. On the farm, Larry and I were, oh, I don't know, maybe six years old, seven, I don't know, very young, and we had ducklings on the farm, and we each caught a duckling, and we said, let's see if they can swim. So we went to the water trough, which was a big wooden water trough, about three feet deep, and we put these ducks on there. And they both swam over to the other side. And of course, I was afraid that the ducks might drown. And I reached over to grab my duck, and it fell in. And my half was in, and half was out. Larry grabbed me by the legs and pulled me back. So we started walking back to the farmhouse <clears throat> and uh, I had, a, had some gum in my pocket somehow and I took out a stick of gum and I chewed it and Larry says, can I have one? I says, no. You know how boys are. I says, no. Well, he says, next time you fall in the truck, I'm going to leave you there. <laughs> so. Larry, Larry was the more talented than I was in doing things. So we built a wooden sleigh with runners on it and whatnot. But he was the he was the chief builder. He knew how to do that. I was not a I was not a carpenter or a, or a inventor sort of thing. But Larry was very good at stuff like that. I admire him and. Uh, I don't know what to say. I, I guess he was the more rambunctious one. I was the more tamer, <laughs> if you want to call that. And, um, but we, we got along together. We were two opposites, really, but we, uh, we got along wonderfully. So that's about all I want to say right that's now. because he had to fight you for the bottle. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a story I hear. I don't remember it, but uh, <laughs> but he, I was older than him, a year older, yeah, and, and he, he was and he was still on the bottle. <laughs> but I I snuck the bottle away from him, and uh, I was using it. <laughs> so um, did Uncle Ernie have a bottle too? <laughs> He was, he was much older. I don't know what happened with him. I don't know. But anyway, uh, other, others come in and, and uh, tell some more stories. Well, Larry and I go way back to the time we both went to school when I was in grade three and he was in grade one. And from there on, we it was Mountain View School in Saskatchewan, and of course this was a little rural school. So the we always made our own entertainment. We had our own basketball team. We played end to over. Does anybody know about that game? That's where you throw the ball over the roof and hope the other guy could catch it. <laughs> and, and if they caught it, they would run around, and if they tacked you, you got you had to stay on their team. So this is how you eliminate the other side. But anyway, uh, Larry, I can remember him very well because we used to go to his house. They had a snare.